Show me the crypto. <laughs> Show me the crypto. <laughs> Show me the crypto. In a world on the brink of disruption, two men will bring you clarity by interviewing some of the most intelligent and influential names in the blockchain world. Welcome to Show Me the Crypto with your hosts, Wade Patterson and Ulf Lonegren. Well, hi there and welcome to Show Me the Crypto. My name is Wade Patterson. And I'm Ulf Lonegren. We're a couple of friends from Canada who love learning about cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, and we're happy you're along for the ride. Whether you're a crypto virgin or you know your way around the block, we hope our interviews with some of the most intelligent and influential people in the blockchain space help deliver you with value. And on this episode, we're joined by Micah Isogawa, CEO of Webacy, which helps users secure their digital assets for the unexpected. Born in the Tokyo suburb of Musash Kogane, Micah grew up in both Japan and Minnesota before she eventually went on to attend Stanford University, join Cirque du Soleil, work as a cybersecurity engineer with Microsoft, co-found Webacy, become an international TV reporter for Earthshot TV, and if all of that's not enough, also be named a Forbes 30 Under 30 recipient. Micah's current pinned tweet is hot people build hot companies. Micah, welcome to Show Me the Crypto. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. We're stoked to have you on. And so I named a long list of things and there's more that you've done as well. I believe you captained the ultimate team while at Stanford. You came out with an EP in poetry during the pandemic. What drives you to have so many different projects and so many different fields on the go? That's a good question. I think I've always had a lot of interests. Um, I love life and there's a lot of different hobbies and things about science and nature and all the things that we could do as human beings that excite me. And so I just try to get the most out of every day. That's awesome. And so I want to start off with Cirque du Soleil. Obviously, we're going to get into all things Webacy and your experience of blockchain tech. But the circus arts career is just such an interesting one. My understanding is that it started with the somewhat edgy absinthe and then moved into Cirque du Soleil. But can you, for the benefit of our audience, can you really dive into your full background with the circus arts? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up between Tokyo and also Minnesota. And strangely enough, uh, Minnesota has one of the largest youth circuses in the country of the United States. And you guys are from Canada, so you get the whole Montreal Cirque du Soleil background. But for the States, it's not that popular or well-known of an activity. So I grew up from age like 11 or 12, I went to a summer camp for circus arts, got into acrobatics, found out I was pretty good at it. And just over time, I would go after school. So that was my after school activity, trained throughout high school. Um, and then when I graduated from high school, I never really thought that I would work professionally for circus. It just wasn't a uh, top of mind or a goal of mine. Um, but while I was at Stanford, the first quarter, I had this opportunity from an old circus coach come up who she had previously worked at Cirque du Soleil, but she had a coworker working at Absinthe in Vegas uh, who still works now. Uh, but they were trying to replicate the show to send it to Australia. Um, and so they were looking for um, a male and female aerial straps duo uh, to do this. And uh, me and my partner, who be, my friend who had become my partner uh, for the act, uh, she recommended us. And we were young and cheap and excited. And so uh, we, we took the job. We, we got the job offer, started touring in Australia, um, all of those big cities uh, absent, uh, w with absent in Australia. Um, and that's where we came across Cirque du Soleil's uh, totem. And so typically with these shows, when you are in the same city, you tend to you know, give each other tickets to see the show as uh, entertainers. And so I went to see the show and met the crew. And they just so happened to have an open position for a female aerial artist who had good like aerial background, um, was a certain height, looked a certain way, and they happened to be going to Japan next. So hmm. stars were aligning, my show was ending, they had this open position and everything's kind of just seemed to happen by happenstance and luck. And so that's kind of how I ended up at Cirque du Soleil's totem. That's awesome. And and further to your background, you know, we mentioned in the bio, you were studying at Stanford and you went on to become a cybersecurity engineer at Microsoft. Can you tell us a little bit about that side of your background and how and like what exactly were you studying? How did the opportunity with Microsoft come about? Yeah, definitely. So I think my interest in technology and application of that kind of started at a young age also. Um, I wanted to be an astrophysicist when I grew up. So I was one of those nerdy kids watching the History Channel before it got weird into aliens and stuff. It was more like <laughs> outer space, 
uh, all, all the cool stuff about black holes. You must so like Discovery too. Discovery was always great. Love Discovery. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> still love Discovery Channel. Um, yeah, it's still great. But yeah, so I, I was studying physics in school uh, prior to leaving for Cirque du Soleil. And then when I went and traveled the world, I was 18 when I started and I kind of learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about life. And I think the, the science, the hard science path was, I discovered maybe not for me. Uh, I didn't want to get a PhD. I didn't want to be in school for a really long time. Um, I discovered that computer science, engineering, uh, building things in the now and the current space was something that was also really interested to me, interesting to me, and I thought I could make an impact right away. So I changed my major to be more of a computer science engineering major and then started studying things like cryptography, algorithms, machine learning, AI. And then, you know, the, the cybersecurity and security space interests me also because it's just a, it's a fundamental value system of our entire world and the systems that we run on. Um, so that was the entrance there. And then, you know, the path to Microsoft was just kind of a zigzag moment for me as I clearly do with everything in my life, but somehow <laughs> ended up just fine. Yeah. Was that just a matter of like, you know, typical job posting, applying around, or was there, a, you know, some other way you ended up actually securing that position? Yeah. So Microsoft was interesting. That was my first time entering a kind of a big company, like one of the, one of the large boys. Um, but previously, I'd worked at just startups. So cybersecurity startups, uh, fintech startups, really kind of getting my hands dirty with them. Uh, and so I ended up working for Microsoft. They, they reached out to me. So a recruiter reached out during my, the end of my junior year in that senior rising senior summer um, and had me go through the application process. Uh, it also happened to be during COVID. So there's a couple mm -hmm. different decisions into going into it because some of my friends who had taken um, startup positions were getting their job rescinded because of the right. COVID situation. So Microsoft was safe. I knew I could learn a lot. It was a great opportunity, great company too. So that was another decision-making moment. And so at what point sort of along your journey here did you first discover blockchain technology and what grabbed your interest and, and what were your initial impressions? Yeah, blockchain kind of goes back. Um, I hate to use this word, but some of my nerdy uh, co-workers <laughs> at Cirque du Soleil, um, they... So at Cirque du Soleil, it's clearly a very active and physically engaging job, but you're so physically engaging that for many people, their mental mind gets to kind of tackle other things. So I had a couple of these coworkers who were really getting into Bitcoin back in 2014, 2015, so pretty early. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I first got introduced to it. Clearly, I was a student, so I didn't have money to invest. Otherwise, I'd be on a yacht island somewhere, <laughs> you know, having a great time. Uh, but that's when I started researching blockchain technology and getting uh, really enticed by the possibilities of what it could what it could be. And part of it comes from because I had grown up internationally and had now at that moment been working internationally, I ran into a lot of things about identity verification, opening up bank accounts, all of these things that just were way harder than they needed to be. And I thought that blockchain could um, improve a lot of these systems that we are traditionally built on um, that made it hard for people to live uh, a freer global life. Um, so that's, got, well, that's what got me interested over time. Uh, I think I, I got into DeFi a little bit over the DeFi run 2017 area and then NFTs in 2021. But my full dive didn't really start until Webacy 2021. 2021. That's what I was going to just yeah. kind of ask because if, for someone who was exposed to yeah. Bitcoin and interested back in 2013, 2014, I mean, that was a long time ago. There wasn't really a lot else going on with blockchain technology beyond Bitcoin at that point. So, you know, you mentioned here, you only really got in uh, just in the last year or so. Was there, you know, anything leading up to that, just like from an investing standpoint or, or any, you know, what, what, what hooked you to think, hey, I want to start working in this space. I want to build something in this space. Yeah. So I think traditionally I can be a little bit of a skeptic about stuff, which is totally fine for crypto. Everyone's a little bit of a skeptic for all kinds of reasons. Um, but I, I started putting in a little bit of money here and there. I've lost mostly in, in the space as I've learned, but I like to think of it as an education fund, just like you pay for school and that money's gone forever. Um, but I think one, one big thing was that everyone I met that was smart and kind and driven was starting to move to crypto. Uh, and I think that following um, the interests of people around you that make you want to be better is something that I've always done, whether it be through circus, through school and everything. And that surrounding yourself with people that improve you is something that's super important for personal growth. And it happened to be that everyone who I wanted to be like or who I was inspired by was getting into crypto and Web3. Um, so I, I knew something was up, started looking into it myself. And then over time, just realized like this is something huge uh, and that's something that could change a lot of systems if done correctly. 
So how did the idea for Webacy come about? Yeah, so Webacy came about in a pretty straightforward way. Uh, I personally had a family member that passed away. And within that process, I realized that I mean, you, you recognize all kinds of things. First of all, you have the, you know, the personal moment of, ah, our life is short and all of these little things that happen from a philosophical level. But more from a technical level, you see all the, the stuff that we leave behind, like wills, estate planning, probate court, all the mess that is in our traditional Web2 lives that is super old. This has been around for hundreds of years, these systems. Um, but then through that process, I don't want to touch that old stuff because it's complete governmental mess. But the new stuff, all of our digital assets and digital accounts, we had no way to manage, protect, pass on. There were no laws around it. There were no rules. Um, and these things are becoming more and more valuable as we become more technologically advanced in civilization. So our digital lives are online. Some of our identities are curated online. And then with crypto now, we have financial assets online also, which are not controlled by centralized systems. So I thought that there needed to be tools to better manage these things, better pass them on. Um, so historically, WebSea started as a way to answer that question of what happens to your crypto when you die. Uh, we've grown a lot from there. Uh, we've turned more into like a management and safety company that creates infrastructure to guardrail the space to you know grow the overall users that can come into Web3. But that's where we originally started. It's such an interesting topic. Alf and I have talked about this in the past because in our the city we live in, in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, there's not... Like some of our friends are somewhat interested in crypto, but the majority are not. They're just, it's not something we talk about. That's one of the reasons we started this podcast is so we had to have other people to chat to about uh, crypto and whatnot. But we've had that conversation of like, shit, what if something happens and like there's value there and how is that passed down? I've, I've talked to my wife about it, and but like I don't know how much she's retained in terms of like steps to take and everything along those lines. So in terms of how Webacy specifically works, like, or at least the initial thought of, of what happens when you die, like, like, how does that safeguard against somebody not knowing what to do? Yeah, the interesting thing about crypto specifically is that even if you write in a will or tell somebody that they get to have your stuff when you pass away, there's no actual way to transfer that without the keys, right? Um, and with crypto being the way it is, if you give some of the keys prematurely, that they now have access to your crypto, it's kind of a security hole. And so we wanted to figure out a way for people to, number one, not have to give anyone their keys, other, you know, they can maintain them themselves, and also rest assured that their beneficiaries can retrieve their crypto. Uh, so this is kind of what started the journey is that we built this on-chain, non-custodial way uh, and no access way. So we didn't need keys. We didn't need passwords, no seed phrase, nothing. We didn't need to take custody. We didn't need users to stake any tokens, stake their NFTs, anything at all to transfer to their beneficiaries. Uh, and once we realized we could do that, we realized we could tackle other use cases like just pure loss of access, like forgetting your seed phrase or losing your password to your MetaMask account. Or real story, deleting your MetaMask off of your Chrome profile because you want to sell your old computer and then it syncs to your new computer and you lose your MetaMask. And then you don't receive phrase. So that actually happened. So that's one use case. And then we also realized that the hacking, phishing, scam like, space is very, very hot, uh, obviously, because there's a ton of money in crypto. Uh, and so we created a backup, uh, like a kind of a panic button to transfer all of your assets to a backup wallet too. Um, so as we were building this crypto will, we just built technology that could become infrastructure for all kinds of use cases, right? And so that's how what we see is going. That's how we're moving forward. And that's why we're super excited is because, again, leveraging blockchain technology for what it was for before is to utilize code instead of middlemen. So, and, and so where is WebC today in regards to how it functions and how it protects users from these types of scenarios versus like what the vision might be for WebSC down the road. Because as you mentioned, it can spin off and provide many different solutions. So what you know, what where is it at today and what are those possibilities for the future? Yeah, so today we're in private beta. Those uh, those features I mentioned before, like the backup wallet, the panic button for emergency, you know, emergency transfers and the crypto will, those are all live and being used by users in our beta today which is awesome. Um, and we're token gated for now. We're going to release to the public eventually. But as we're building and building new features for users and building exactly what they want, we're keeping it in private. Um, but the vision, ideally, like this is stuff that should be just nascent in our systems, right? The way that you don't have to think about crossing the street because the light's green and the systems of the entire network work so that a car won't hit you, hopefully. Uh, or like the, the bank accounts will flag something suspicious because it's just built into the algorithms. There are certain guardrails that should be built within the infrastructure of Web3 
that is going to make, again, kind of the, the Web3 audience grow from what it is today to what it needs to be, like 100 times, like a 1,000 times to survive and thrive. Uh, so ideally, you don't even have to think about the company, WebSea. We're there where you need it most. Uh, we're there when you need it in an emergency situation, when the unexpected happens, even when you don't, or even when you're setting up exciting things. Like when you get married, you need like a crypto prenup, you know, or you make a lot of, you grab a lot of bags because you made some good investments and you need an, uh, a trust fund for your kids. So these are all things that are possible and are, you know, on our, on our vision board uh, that we're actively working towards. But it's pretty exciting to think about just creating better things so that all of these small stories that you hear about don't happen or the big stories that you hear about don't happen anymore. And and so with Webacy, you know, your goal of, like you mentioned, at some point, people don't even think of Webacy. It's just these things are baked into, it's, it's just the way it works so that uh, users don't have to fret about these concerns. It's all part of crypto. With that being said, you know, is Webacy always going to be its own sort of platform in regards to like its own wallet that you need to store your crypto in in order to you get the benefits or will Webacy one day be integrated with many different wallets or like the technology or the offering that Webacy provides and it will be more uh, widespread and easily accessible. That's the beauty of it all. So we don't actually, since we don't take custody, we can integrate with any mm. kind of non- non-custodial wallet. Right, so we could integrate into marketplaces, uh, wallets, exchanges, dexes, anywhere where values, exchanging hands, being touched, being modified, all of that. Right, and that's also the beauty of running a startup that's this young in the space is we get to we get to kind of uh, build the future of it. And since we're all so early in crypto, as we all like to say, we are driving the vision of what it could be. So luckily, we're in those conversations, and that's the vision we're hoping for. Is there any possible? Downside. So you think about like like a kill switch or something happening to and, and my apologies that I don't fully understand like the inner workings of of how this works. But um, is there any chance that prematurely, if a, a significant event hadn't happened, like a death or something like that, that the assets could be moved uh, prematurely? Is that is that possible or no? I'm glad you're asking these questions because everyone in crypto should be skeptical again of anything that they're using and all the security features of everything that they're implementing, right? Uh, So luckily, we've architected architected it in a way where it's not automatic. So a lot of it is user-generated. Actually, most of the actions are manually generated by the user that owns the wallet themselves. So nobody else has access to it. Webacy is a company. We don't have access to anything you set up on our platform. We're kind of like the the software for you to build your own adventure of what you want to use with what we have available. So the great part is even if you, you know, protect your assets with Webacy, we as a company, if we, you know, we don't have any access to be able to trigger the panic button on your behalf. It's just the user on their own. So that's one great thing. Uh, some questions we get about is what if the user, uh, you know, sets up their crypto will and they haven't passed away yet. Uh, we have an on-chain monitoring system for the heartbeat of whether you are alive or not. So we actually monitor activity on Web3. So that's the best part about crypto is we can see what you're doing with your wallet. If you buy something, exchange something, transfer something, uh, you can see that it's all recorded on chain. So as long as you're alive and doing stuff, there's no possibility of anything ever being transferred. And the other part of it is that your beneficiary has to double opt in, right? So this is ideally someone who you trust who would actually have to claim the assets that you leave behind. So and maybe you just kind of answered that question, but like, how does it work? Because because in the scenarios we were just talking about, someone has to sort of trigger the button. But in the scenario where the individual dies, how then is that sort of proven? Um, and, and so that your beneficiaries can, you know, claim access? Yeah, great question. So as I was speaking about the, the heartbeat monitoring, uh, right now we have a so basically, over time, we're monitoring your heartbeat. We take 12 months of consecutive inactivity as a red flag in our system. Uh, so like all crypto, you don't have to give us any personal information. But as part of your account, if you want to give us your email and phone number to contact you, we can do that. So at 12 months, we'll start to ping you. We'll send a carrier pledge in. We'll call your mom, whatever you wanted to, us to do to try to test for your lifeness. And then we have a two-month gap, like a grace period for this kind of um, contact. So that's a total of 14 months for now. We're going to allow users to adjust it to their own liking in the future, but for now. And at that 14 months period, we trigger the dead man switch, which is kind of a misnomer because as I mentioned before, we don't automatically transfer anything. We can't. 
And the smart contract doesn't either. So what gets triggered is the ability for your beneficiary to come and claim assets at that point. So again, if hoping that you set it up so your beneficiaries are people you trust, if they know you are comatose and are going to wake up, they won't touch your assets, right? Uh, but again, it's this is again on the responsibility of the user since we are non-custodial that they are setting things up in the way they want to do so. So what is the process of setting up the beneficiary? What does that look like? It's pretty straightforward. So the same process for setting up the beneficiary as the backup wallet and the panic button. So luckily, it's all kind of in one flow. You can pick and choose what you want to do. Uh, but you connect your wallet just like you would on OpenSea. We're able to read all the assets in your wallet. You pick which assets you want to, like, to store and to leave. You will tell us who are your beneficiaries. For now, your beneficiaries need to have an address. So assuming this could be a brother that has a wallet, you could set up a wallet, whatever the case is. In the future, we're going to have more of a hand-holdy, like, non-crypto native flow that could involve liquidating the assets, whatever you want to set up, um, especially with spouses sometimes don't know or kids that are too young, that kind of thing. Uh, and so right now you set the beneficiary wallet address, you set this uh, like approval, the pre-approval on your wallet that only you control, and then that's pretty much it. So it's really straightforward. And again, like in nowhere in the flow, you have to give your password, your seed phrase, any of it, which is actually really great. And then you can also read all of the things that you've set up yourself. And it sounds like then in order for this to work, there has to be the proactiveness in advance. There's no way that someone who passed away <clears throat> without setting all of this up in advance could benefit at all through WebC, correct? Let me tell you, if I had figured out a solution to <laughs> yeah. recovering lost assets, I think something like 20% of all crypto is gone forever. Like mm. that, we would not be talking right now. <laughs> I'm yeah, just kidding. That's but no, that, that would be solve all, that would solve all problems, but unfortunately not possible. And what about, so I'm, I'm still thinking more about the possible scenarios that could play out, you know, in, in the case where you do die and you have set up your beneficiaries. So what if, because we're still in a world today where a lot of people are not crypt, familiar with crypto. They're not familiar with how everything works. They're not familiar with having a crypto wallet. And so I understand that I could set up a beneficiary. I could I could create a wallet for someone and maybe say, okay, go to, you know, send the funds to this wallet. But what about in the scenario where they're just not that technically adept? Is there ever is you know, is there a chance that there's still risk there simply because of a lack of education? I think so. I mean, I think there's a lack of education in the in the whole ecosystem in general that we need to work on, but like, like I mentioned, we're, we're working really hard on a beneficiary flow for users that are non-crypto native because this is such a huge necessity kind of in the space. So there's a couple options. Uh, you could kind of educate them on the flow to help them set up the wallet and recover it and access it and so on. That would require ID verification. So a little bit of KYC to kind of verify that user is a true user trying to access it. Uh, so that gets a little into a tricky situation. The other option is just liquidating, right? So kind of sending the assets to your clearinghouse, which would require a little bit, again, either partnerships or a little bit of legal advancements. So the, the, we, I, I like to think it's kind of brilliant way we've architected all of this is to avoid a lot of the um, responsibility and the liability that a company can fall into when you take custody of assets, right? We don't, we don't want to be a, a wallet. We don't want to be a lot of these things uh, because, again, you're, you're dealing with people's finances. Uh, and so there's a lot more there. Whereas right now, uh, we have the software for users to better protect themselves in the space. And so we, we're tackling definitely the non-custodial area as well. Uh, but we're walking a fine line between uh, how we can support users and how we don't take keys from our users. Because I'm a strong believer in the non, not your keys, not your crypto kind of space. Um, and so we're, we're trying to stay true to the decentralized dream here. Ulf, do you realize our audience has been either watching or listening to this episode for 20 minutes? 20 minutes? No, they should probably subscribe. Yeah, they should subscribe. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you comment and turn on notifications. And if you're listening to this podcast, especially if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating and a review. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and even TikTok. So go check out the episode description. You can find all that information below. And we have an update on the NFT, don't we? That's right. We didn't previously mention this, but this NFT for our OG supporter is a one of one. There will only be one of this kind ever minted. And we have a few surprises for the person who purchases it. The link is in the episode description. And back to the episode. 
All right. I think this is my last question. <laughs> I know I'm pestering you about, you know, what in these what if situations, but uh, I think it's good to ask these questions because these might be what other people are trying to figure out too. And so um, another question on the beneficiary side is, this might have just been my lack of understanding. You mentioned there's a two month window uh, where the beneficiary has to claim it. So what it, what happens if they don't claim it? Do, you know, do they lose the potential to claim it just because they were late or? Or are there different options in those scenarios? So the two-month window was actually the period where we're co- trying to contact you. So the, four, oh, the 12 months, yeah. The 12 months is just to confirm whether you've been active or not. The two months is to remind you if you are alive that we, we need some signal from you. Gotcha, um, that way we're gotcha. not pinging you every month because I think every month pinging is unnecessary to verify life. You can just read it on chain. So yeah. And so thereafter, beneficiaries have an infinite amount of time. They could claim 10 years later if it was still right f- theirs to claim. Is that right? So again, this is where it gets into a little bit of a tricky situation. So have you heard of a sheetment law? I don't want to get too technical about policy, but we can talk about it. It's maybe something that no one's heard of before. Yeah, no, let, let's Yeah, let's yeah, let's, let's jump it. in. I, I haven't know, heard of it. Heard. Also, this is a very... Um, I think a lot of people don't like getting into the space. Number one, because it's not sexy at all. Uh, but number two, there's so much regulatory when it comes to every state, at least in the U.S., is different laws. And then if you go country to country, as you know, everything is completely different. Um, so within the United States, there's something called a sheetment law, and every state has a different time period and rule about it. Uh, but technically, what it sets up is that depending on the state, after a certain amount of time, any unclaimed assets or assets that are inactive are actually recoverable by the state. So they go back to the state. Uh, so money in a bank account goes back to a state. Technically, money in your crypto wallet should be going back to the state, right? So there's a lot of uh, legal considerations in there too, um, especially when it comes to estate planning um, and estate claims. And um, so right now we have it set up that the beneficiaries have a year to claim after that 14 month period, which I think is more than enough time. Uh, but we're we're still discovering um, the right timing to do that. We may have to go like a, a jurisdiction by jurisdiction uh, definition based on that. So what's the, just kind of taking a step back and, you know, as the founder of this company, what's the process been like? I mean, how many people do you have working on Webacy? And just as you've navigated all of the different legalities everywhere and everything like that, like, what's this process been like building Webacy to this point? This has been probably one of the most fun and most difficult things I've ever done uh, and likely will probably ever do in my career. Um, I've learned so much. Like I like really, I used to, you know, perform 10 shows a week in a pink bikini in front of a stage of thousands of people. And this is much harder than what I used to do before. So uh, it's been quite the journey. Um, Everything from fundraising to building a team. The team is seven strong right now, which is awesome. Uh, And we're hiring, which is great because we want to bring more people in to build this vision with us. Um, yeah, everything from just learning how to build a team, how to be a leader, how to fundraise, um, how to sell, right? And everything in between has been such a process, but it's been so fruitful and cannot wait to just, you know, keep that journey going. Nice, nice. That's awesome. And some other aspects, again, going outside of the technology itself and maybe just more informational around some of the things we found looking on the WebSC website. Um, one of the, there's a tool on the website to calculate sort of how much value you have at risk by entering your wallet address. And the calculation, Wade and I played around with this, and it was, uh, we didn't totally understand how that calculation is made. I'm sure it's through, you know, on-chain assets in your wallet, but, uh, but maybe you could explain more specifically how the calculation works yeah like is it taking floor values of nfts or like how does that yeah derive yeah that's a great question too so we were building this because i think people in the space it's very easy to forget that the things that we own in the space have value it kind of feels like play money i don't know if like (laughs) 0.5 ETH to you just seems like okay whatever but if you translate it it's like a significant chunk of dollar amount um, and so I think we forget that in the space. And if you look at your NFTs, you're like, oh, I have one NFT. It could be worth $300,000. You forget about this thing. Um, and so we built this calculator, both as a lead generator, but also just to kind of inform people like this happens. And you hear stories all the time. Unfortunately, I am myself a victim of like a phishing scam because I was dumb one time and clicked on something, right? These are things that could happen in an instant that you don't even think about. Uh, and so the calculation itself, um, obviously the tokens have just a market price value exchange that we do in real time. Uh, but then also we ver- we utilize a couple different APIs to calculate the NFT value. So it's either a combination of NFT floor price 
if it recently sold what that price was, kind of the, if there's a special like, um, what's it called? Like a characteristic of the NFT. And then you kind of average over the, like the current floor price or sale price of those NFTs. Um, so for example, if your monkey has a special hat, you can you know, average out <laughs> over the special hat monkeys um, and take that price too. So it's, it's a rough estimate, of course. Uh, it's not going to be perfect, but that's how we generate that value. What you said is so relatable. There's been so many times where I've been in a store and I'm like a hundred dollars and then I won't like bat an eye at 0.1 ETH. It's like, oh, <laughs> like nothing. It happens all the time. Uh, speaking of NFTs, Grimmies, what's that all about? Grimmies, thank you for pronouncing it correctly. Some people have called them Grimies. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> but not it's like Grim sure Reaper, right? Grim Reaper, exactly. is that? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, they're Grimmies. Yeah, so this, I love the Grimmies. Uh, it was done by a female artist called Grace Lee. She's an absolute rock star. Um, but the, the concept for WebSC was number one, we wanted to token gate the platform because uh, we wanted to build with a really small, awesome cohort of users that were excited about what we're building, could give us direct feedback, yada, yada. And so we wanted to token gate it. And at that time, I'm sure you've seen them. There's plenty of these 3D rotating like 1155 cards going around that access like token gate products, right? Mm -hmm. So we knew we wanted to do that. But we knew that with an NFT collection, we could make number one things a lot more fun. Uh, we could add lore to it. We could build a community around it. We could, um, we could, we could generate fans of just the pure artwork by itself that become a pipeline to users of Webacy that care about protecting their assets. Uh, but then secondly, we could actually partner with a lot of different awesome NFT collections, right? So if, that's how we minted out the first thousand very quickly was we went to a few different baller NFT collections, said, hey, we're doing this. This is the NFT. And they uh, they gave my, uh, kind of whitelist spots to their community. And people got excited about it. So our waitlist is huge just by doing that. Um, and that's why we're super excited about Grimmies. Um, we've only, again, we've only released a thousand. So we're going to do some more later on. But we'll, we'll see over time. So Wade and I have talked to a number of guests about this who are building in the space. And it's because going back to when we started this channel, this podcast, there was so many guests that we had spoken to who were who started building uh, in, in the blockchain space in 2017, or earlier, I should say, um, well, no, in 2017, but going into 2018, right? Basically, they were building during the bear market, the last bear market. And um, seeing that these projects had made it through and survived and had grown, we've seen it where maybe it's not such a bad idea to be building in the bear market. But I wanted to get your thoughts being someone who's now, you know, building and here we are in a definite bear market in crypto. Do you think that is a good thing and that will inevitably help in the long run? Or do you think it is in fact just tougher to get adoption and perhaps, you know, to get the traction you want when you're building in this type of an environment? I think this is a really awesome topic and a really good question. Um, I don't want to come off like I sound like I have rose-colored glasses on, but I think that building in a bear market is probably one of the best things that at least my company could be doing. Number one, um, I think in this kind of bear market, you can't survive unless you have an actual product or actual service that people want to use. So that's awesome. Like, Why do we need companies that are making tons of millions of dollars on absolute nothing or Ponzi schemes, Ponzi nomics? We don't need that right now. Um, like people got to have their fun and do that and make a bag off of you know nothing. Um, but I think that people are getting smarter and people are caring more about things like legitimacy or actually paying for services that they need. Uh, and overall, in the long run, like eventually, yes, the market's going to be an upturn. Uh, but building this company now, since we're early, we get to actually build a company that is profitable, that has basic structure, that has a road to revenue, uh, that is building something people want, need, are willing to use even in the spare market, right? So. There's all kinds of things that stripped down a lot of the fluff that was happening during all of the exciting bull runs that we saw, which was very fun um, and very freeing and flightly. Um, but for me now, I get to kind of see what it's like to... How do you build a company from the ground up in a time when it's really difficult? Um, and luckily, being in the safety and management space, people know that this is something that they need. Um, and it's also something that people need to start thinking about more seriously uh, as we see all the hacks and you know the bridge vulnerabilities that come up to. So not to be a Debbie Downer and bring up those topics that we like to never mention. But yes, it's... We love for, to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
One thing I forgot to mention before, I just like to be transparent with the audience. I picked up two Grimmies, so I am an owner of two Grimmy oh, NFTs. Thank you. Just, yeah, yeah, just throwing it out there. I don't want to be called out for uh, pumping a project that I belong to. But uh, the other thing I was going to ask you about is marketing. So, so what's your strategy? I mean, obviously, education piece. I know you've been on a number of podcasts talking about this, but what's your strategy to really get the education out there to people? Because once we took the time to, to learn about this a little bit, it was that awesome aha moment of, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. We've talked about this issue before. So what's your process for getting the word out? Yeah, so we've been doing quite a few things. Um, on the WebSC and Grimmies team, we like to do weekly you know, Twitter spaces and then Discord AMAs where we talk about this kind of stuff. Um, obviously, our reach is limited because it's kind of limited to our community and the eyes on our community. So we try to take other paths to educating. So me personally, uh, I've been you know speaking at conferences or talking to smaller groups um, I think one thing that I'm also passionate about is allowing or like educating people that may be uh, less likely to come into the space. So for example, I am a woman. And so I go to women's groups and offer talks or have uh, workshops about safety and security because it's super important. And one bad experience could send a user away who could be a lifetime user if they had a better experience, right? Or had the right like education when they were entering the space. Uh, so there's a bunch of different women's groups doing that. Uh, but also on top of that, we like to partner with other, other NFT collections um, as, as well as kind of partner with bigger groups, which we have a few rolling out that I can't talk about yet. Uh, but we're pretty excited about because um, it's something that needs to... It's a group effort, I think. Like really everyone should be talking about safety. It should be everyone's number one concern. Yeah, it's... It really is important, and we're not joking. When we've had this con, we had the conversation <laughs> about needing this solution, like probably a year ago on our show. I remember. I think it was. Um, I can't remember the guest uh, specifically on which episode, but we've talked about like the need for this. So I think it's mm-hmm. great that now here we are, uh, probably a year or so later, talking about it with a solution in mind, and it's a solution to a real problem. So that that's awesome. Now. Uh, we are nearing the end of this, but I wanted to ask, what did the Forbes 30 under 30 recognition mean to you? Uh, that was probably like one of the craziest days I've ever woken up to because I had no idea it was coming. Uh, it was quite a surprise. Uh, I just remember waking up to one of my teammates texting me about it, basically. Um, and so I have always wanted to be on the list for some reason. Like I think it's... like. It really, if you think about it from a more of like a stoic perspective, there's no need for these external, rec- like, you know, uh, for people recognize, like recognition lists. Um, and a lot of people will kind of smash it and say that, you know, all, all these things about it. But for me, I think it was um, a validation for the choices I made to, for number one, leaving a really stable job and a career path that probably my father would prefer I would stay in <laughs> because he's a Japanese businessman. Um, <laughs> or, you know, just I think... Um, validation of all the hard work that I put in. Um, and also just uh, access to a lot of awesome people that are doing cool things in the world. So it meant a lot. Uh, I also, it was a kind of a kick in the butt that I need to work harder uh, to feel like I earned it. Um, <laughs> so that it was, lit a fire under my butt for sure. So what about like looking f- five years into the future or something. And the reason I ask is because you've already accomplished so many things at such a young age and, and in a variety of different spheres and backgrounds and everything like that. What do you hope to be doing? Like, I mean, is this like, is WebSC your baby? And you're like, I just want to keep growing this thing. Or are you kind of somebody who's like, yeah, I'll be focused on WebSC, but there's a lot of other things I want to accomplish in life. I'm flattered that you called me young uh, because I feel very old. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done. uh, And I think WebSC has a lot of work to do. Uh, So 99% 99% of my efforts are focused on WebSC. But mm-hmm. I think after working professionally in like a hard industry like entertainment, you learn that you need balance. Um, and so I'm very cautious of maintaining uh, my personal balance so I don't burn out as a founder. Because I think that's one really important job of a founder is to like take care of their mental, physical, emotional health so that their company can succeed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's kind of where some of my other hobbies come in. But WebSC is in here for the long run because there's there's just so much to do in this space. And Hopefully a few years from now, you won't even talk about safety and security because that won't be a problem. 100%. Well, as Ulf mentioned, we have a bit of a section at the end of every interview that we like to do with each guest. It's a section we call, you had me at crypto, three rapid fire questions. Ulf's going to ask you those. Okay. All right, Micah, you ready? Let's do it. Okay. The first question, who's your favorite person to follow in the crypto space? 
Oh, this is a wow. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Um, I like Andrew Wang. <laughs> um, That's a good choice. All right. Yep. Yeah. All right. Second question: What will the price of Bitcoin be ten years from now? Ten years from now, uh, what is it today? Like, I don't even know. 21, yeah. 20, 21, yeah, yeah, around twenty, 21. hovering around twenty k. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to be optimistic in my head and say forty. Um, so I think ten years from now, uh, let's do eighty four k. Eighty four k. Okay. Yeah. That is- Oh, how things have changed. Yeah. So like in the last year, it's just been so interesting seeing the predictions. I mean, 2021, we talk about this at the end of every show, I feel like, but at the end of 2021 or in 2021, every prediction was like million, million, yeah, million, yeah, so million. Many. And then like over the last few months, it's been like 400K, 200K, 100,000 yeah, <laughs> going down. But yeah, yeah I think most yeah. people would think that 80K at this point might be optimistic. Yeah, so. yeah. If you ask me the Ethereum price, my answer might be different. So well, let's, let's what is your for answer it. for that? Yeah. Is this your third question? You get three, no, no, right? no, 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 <laughs> two B, two B. Sometimes two A, this B. is two B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually do the Ethereum question quite a bit. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. I think ETH, um, have to say, I'm not like a Bitcoin hater at all. I think there's a lot of use cases, but I think ETH's applications are just through the roof. Um, it's going to only continue to grow. Plus we're building on ETH. Uh, and so I'm going to say overtake Bitcoin, be like 120K, maybe more. I don't know. I could be more optimistic too. Wow. Love it. There we yeah. go. There now we we're go. talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Third question. What is the most underrated coin or project in all of crypto? Other than Webacy. <laughs> well, we don't have a coin, luckily. Otherwise, or I would choose project. Or project. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, project. Yeah. Project. Wanna, yeah. yeah. Uh, great question. Um, ooh, let me think. I think one thing about the space um, is that there's a lot of projects that you don't hear about and it's hard to hear about unless you're like popular on Twitter and all these things. So there's a company called uh, Smoothie. I think their handles with Smoothie that uh, is kind of building like the product hunt for Web3, right? So they highlight new projects every week. Uh, mm-hmm. And I really like looking at that because uh, there's very few places where you kind of get to see all of the new stuff coming out uh, since we're so decentralized at this point, right? Uh, I like what they're doing to highlight a lot of the builders in the space. And it's an excellent team. Um, that's my answer. I'll likely think of more in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's all. I actually like that because now we have Smoothie, which is the underrated project for this episode. But you can go to Smoothie to find more underrated projects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So exactly. Further answers. Layered, yeah. Yes. Endless value. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Micah, this has been such an interesting conversation. What you're building, as we've identified, is clearly a, a solution to a problem that exists. So we wish you all the best going forward. Thank you so much for joining Alf and I on this episode of Show Me the Crypto. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Show Me the Crypto. Please make sure to subscribe as well as rate and review this podcast.